Hello, everybody, and welcome to our latest Hubble Hangout. And this month, Mar if it's the first Wednesday of the month, it must be time for our Hubble Hangout with uh, Dr. Frank Summers, the outreach astronomer, astrophysicist at the Space Telescope Science Institute, who meets with us most months at this time. We didn't do it last week because we were... Uh, occupied last week with uh, South by Southwest and couldn't get to it. But uh, we're back this month. Uh, we had our public lecture series last night. It was a really interesting talk by Dr. Armin Rest, and it is on our website, which I will provide a link to uh, here in, as the, as the uh, Hangout progresses. But um, don't forget, we, we're, we're here for not only to, to present you with the latest news and, and information from Hubble Space Telescope, we also want to get your comments and questions, so please leave a comment on the uh, Google Plus event page. I've just tweeted about it. You can also use the uh, and also uh, Frank's uh, Doctor Fr at Doctor Frank Summers. He's also tweeted about it. Just follow that link and start commenting. You can also tweet using the hashtag Hubble Hangout, and I'll see that. And finally, uh, there's also the YouTube page where this is also being broadcast on our channel. I'm monitoring those comments as well, as well as the Q and A app all kinds of ways to talk to us, so we hope you'll do it, uh, because we don't want to just hear our own voices, we want to hear you guys, at least in the form of comments and, and questions. <laughs> so uh, please uh, please let us know what you think. Frank, welcome. Tony, how you yeah. doing today? I'm good. It's April. It's getting warm out, or at least got trying it. to. Uh, I am so ready for this winter to be over, I'll tell you, it is like... <laughs> season. So, no, uh, um, as I said last month a bunch of times, I can tell you when the vernal equinox is going to happen, but I can't tell you when spring is going to come. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. That's or at least when it's going to feel like it. I mean, uh, I grew I, I lived in Boulder, Colorado for like 30 years and the the you know, it got cold there in January sure, but the snows didn't really hit until March and April. That's when we really got inundated and right now they're getting inundated again, so those spring snows are usually measured in feet. I mean, that's how much snow they get this time of year. Um, so I'm glad I don't have to deal with that. But uh, anyway, it's uh, it's 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 good to be on the upswing, at least on the on the warming trend. So most definitely. How did it go last night? So last night you did the uh, public lecture series. Yeah, we had a great public lecture series. We do it the first Tuesday of every month, and um, uh, Armin Rest was uh, really uh, had a great had a great great talk about light echoes. And uh, the point is, is that you know one of the points I made at the end of the talk was that the speed of light seems infinite in our everyday life, but when in astronomy we can actually see the propagation of light across uh, light years of space and we can actually see things happening in the past and so the um, the use of light echoes to actually observe things that happened a hundred years ago a uh, thousand years ago is actually a really cool prospect and that's what he's exploring so I suggest everyone uh, find that webcast on our site uh, and uh, take a look at it yeah, I'm getting the uh, I'm getting the link together right now, uh, and I'll and I'll post it on the event page. But what Frank is talking about, he, one of the one of the issues that, that Armin brought up was he was studying these light echoes where you could actually see from subtracted images from one year to another of a supernova, you could see these expanding light waves or light echoes, he called them. And what Frank's talking about is that yes, you know, this is an example of the distances in astronomy are so vast that you can actually see the speed of light in uh, in, in in operation there. So. Uh, it really was a great talk, and I'll post a link here in just a second. So Frank's going to give us a little uh, summary of some of the stories he's got his eye on, oh. and uh, I'm going to go ahead and let you get started, Frank. Go ahead. <laughs> In the meantime, I'm going to post that link. Go ahead. All right. right here. So, um, all right. So I'm going to talk to you about the news from the universe for April 2014, and every night, every month at the public lecture series, I give our uh, an update on the. Uh, public uh, on, on recent Hubble discoveries, and sometimes I include other uh, discoveries, but uh, this month I only have some Hubble things. And so my first story is, call I called it a clockwork galaxy. Now I did this because, uh, well, you'll see why I did this, but um, what are the cool things we've been able to do with Hubble that really it wasn't particularly intended to do was to do really high precision astrometry. Now, we've got these uh, instruments on Hubble called the fine guidance sensors. And uh, the 
fine guided sensors in association with some really cool computer techniques have allowed us to measure really, really, really high precision of uh, the positions of stars. And so the first example I remember from a few years ago was in this image. In the, uh, it's a core of the globular cluster Omega Centauri. Now, Omega Centauri contains about a million, maybe 10 million stars. So this is a really, really small patch of it. But what they were able to do is by taking images of this field several years apart and by using computer processing to really measure the centroids of these star dots, they were able to measure the motions of these stars only over a few years and then extrapolate them to what they would be over 10,000 years. So based upon several images like this, they were able to take those stars in that white box and they're able to figure out that these are their motions, these are their speeds, which is where they will move over the course of the next 10,000 years. Is there a way to tell which one is the extrapolated data points, or does it matter here in this? Well, in this one, you're seeing uh, lines, which basically are, point, are, are, are dots point plotted for each of the stars at a, at a specific interval. So the longer ones with longer tails are ones that are moving faster, uh, across the image, and the ones with the shorter tails are ones that are moving slower. Ah, okay. All right, so what they did is they took the, the star from where it was and they trailed it uh, to show where it, will, uh, where it will be moving to. And do you have an idea how many, how many images was it based on to get the initial starting uh, trajectory? To, to get this, this was only a few years, and I think it was you know, uh, on order three images in terms oh, okay. of trying to measure it. I mean, so the, the, key, yeah, the, the key point here is that um, each of the stars is, has, a, has a point spread function, right? And so it's the, 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 the spot of light spreads out, and that star isn't going to move even a pixel's worth over the course of a few years. But if you model the point spread function really, really carefully, you can actually measure the motion of the centroid of that point spread function on subpixel scales. So you can now measure now. Clarify that that a point spread function is something that the telescope does to the light, the point source of light as it enters the optical tube assembly, right? Exactly. So, so it's stars a function of the telescope that you're looking at. So in this case, the Hubble Space Telescope, as well as the filters that it goes through. Right. It's a, so at the stars are so far away that they would appear in our images as a as a as a point of light. They're just too small to be resolved. So that light of that star is going to get spread out over a certain region, and due to the mirrors and the optics and the camera that you're using, you'll get a different point spread function. Right. And, and so, so by you, removing it, by modeling that, and then removing that effect you get a point again, and you're able to then be able to get uh, these measurements you're talking about that take less than a pixel. Well, it's not really removing the point spread function. What it is is you're measuring the centroid of it. So um, in oh, as much okay. as if that okay. point spread function moves just like uh, a tenth of a pixel to the right, well, then the pixel to, to the right of it will get a little bit more uh, light, and the pixel to the left of it will get a little less light. Got it. Yeah, okay, sure. Right. So yeah. you're measuring on subpixel scales down to like hundreds of a pixel or even thousands of a, a few thousands of a pixel in some cases. All right, and so here they're able to measure motions within a globular cluster without having to actually wait for the stars to move and help understand you know the gravitational thing uh, all the the in, uh, amazing amount of gravity and interactions that's occurring inside a globular cluster. Uh, then uh, just a couple years ago. Uh, we applied that same idea uh, to the Andromeda galaxy. So uh, on the right you see uh, the Andromeda galaxy and you, and you see that small pullout box where there are some Hubble observations spaced over five to seven years looking at the stars in Andromeda. <laughs> wow, that is crazy. Look at all yeah. those galaxies. <laughs> right? And so the idea was that because you're looking at the halo of Andromeda, well away from the center, center, the really dense disk of Andromeda, you can also see not only the stars in Andromeda, but also the background galaxies. And so you can use the background galaxies as a rest frame, things that aren't going to move, and try to measure the motions of the stars. And again, using this point spread function technique, where you're really trying to measure it, they were able to measure the motions of these stars down to seven one thousandths of a pixel. <laughs> wow. 
All right, so you're really able to measure incredibly fine motions of these stars, and as you remember, Tony, uh, the motion of, of that, that was for the first time we were able to measure the sideways motion of Andromeda across the sky, what we call the proper motion of Andromeda, and the result was that the uh, velocity vector of Andromeda galaxy is consistent with it coming straight towards the Milky Way, and perhaps in four billion years, our night sky will look like this, with both the Milky Way and Andromeda smashing through one another, ripping each other to shreds in a galactic collision. I don't know about you, but I'm going to be there. I'll have my head in one of those Futurama, uh, Futurama domes there, you know. <laughs> I'll be there watching. Like that. You and Richard Nixon, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Okay. That's my plan. That's your plan. All right, so we've done this already, um, but now we're able to do it uh, in another really cool way. All right, and so the really cool m measurement this time is for another galaxy, not the Andromeda galaxy, but this one. And this is the Large Magellanic Cloud. And the Large Magellanic Cloud is one of the dwarf galaxies around the Milky Way. We have uh, two major... You see it from the southern hemisphere. Yep, can see see from the southern hemisphere. We have two major uh, galaxies around the Milky Way: the Large Magellanic Cloud and the Small Magellanic Cloud, and then we've got like a dozen other or, or so smaller ones. Now, the LMC is classified as a dwarf irregular galaxy, and I've always thought of it as an irregular galaxy, but it isn't quite as irregular as you know one might think. There is actually some structure. You can see across the center of this image. There's a bar. All right, there's that long straight region, uh, which yep. makes it sort of look like, well, maybe it's a, a, it, it resembles a barred spiral galaxy or the center of a barred spiral galaxy. So if you take a deeper exposure of, that Im uh, of the LMC, uh, you'll get an image like uh, this one that's coming up. It's taking a second to come up. <sighs> Network of problem. All right. Oh. Uh -huh. There we go. Um, there it get, is. This is a deeper exposure. Um, this is an image from Stefan Guizard, who gave us permission to use it. Thank you very much, Stefan. That's a marvelous image. But you can see that not only is there that bar across the center, but there are also hints of spiral arms uh, extending off either side of the bar. And images like this, deep exposures of like this, have had astronomers ask, well, is was the LMC a small barred spiral galaxy, but that just got uh, distorted or its its, its process it got it got ripped apart a little bit by interactions with the Milky Way or with the Small Magellanic Cloud? We see definite evidence that has interacted with the Small Magellanic Cloud and perhaps with the Milky Way. So perhaps those interactions have changed its morphology. So the question is, so so it leads you to think, well, maybe this could have been a small uh, dw dw uh, barred spiral galaxy. However, if it was a spiral galaxy, it would be rotating. And there would be a disk structure. You know, all that faint stuff that you see there would be a disk structure. So how are we going to measure the rotation? Well, you can do some Doppler shift stuff, but it's pretty much in the plane. So but you're really what you want to do is you want to measure motions of stars. So we applied that same really fine astrometry technique, that really fine position measuring technique, uh, to the large Magellanic Cloud. And this is, next image is not a photograph, it's actually just an illustration. So here's an illustration with a really overexposed version of the LMC. And those red velocity vector, vectors show the motions of the stars in 22 fields uh, around the, uh, in, within the Large Magellanic Cloud. And you'll see that, you know, not all of them are perfectly into a nice rotational pattern but enough of them are that you can see that there is a rotational pattern to the LMC, and it lends credence to the idea that it, that it does have a disk structure uh, and could have, could have been a, barred spiral, a small barred spiral galaxy. And does and, it say anything about the interactions with our own galaxy at all, or is it just its own proper motion? It will be able to in the future. Uh, right now, with the 22 fields they've just measured, they're able to only really c constrain things. But if they get more fields, and in particular they, they measure the small Magellanic Cloud, um, they might be able to say, say more about the potential inter of interactions on okay. things. Uh, it, in particular, the, um, the differential between the LMC measurements and the SMC measurements will give, uh, will give uh, some, some really good information on that. 
you know what I love about this picture is somebody put a put the time to put the moon in there. <laughs> well, that's done for scale. Okay. <laughs> oh, okay. Oh, okay. All right, this this is an illustration. Um, you can see the 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 um. The, the mountains in the foreground are just added in as, as a thing, and okay. the, the, the image moon. is an overexposed thing with stuff on top. And they put the moon in there to give you a scale such that the, uh, the LMC on the sky, when you really expose it, is you know, 10 to 20 times larger than the moon. So the moon, a full moon up in the sky is about a half a degree, right? That's right. Yeah. So if you extend your thumb out, at arm's length, and try to cover, it's about that's about a half a degree. So you can get a sense just how much bigger, uh, that how much that fills our sky. That's amazing. That's really right. a great image. And the the LMC, what you what you see with the human eye when you go down to the southern hemisphere, is going to be much much smaller. But a fully exposed, uh, deep uh, image of the LMC really does cover about 10 degrees across on the sky. Uh, for example, the, the contrast, the, the Andromeda galaxy only covers about three degrees across in the sky. How far away is the LMC? Uh, about 170,000 light years. So, and, and the Andromeda galaxy is a two and a half million, right? Two and a half million, yep. Yeah. So, yeah, that's, that's quite a difference. So, the stars in here are also pretty old, aren't they? Uh, well, the star... Well... What do you mean in terms of well, old? Because okay. <laughs> okay. a lot of them are really new because we got the Tarantula Nebula here, which is the biggest star-forming region anywhere. Okay, maybe, in the yeah, that group. was a poorly framed question. Let me, let me restate <laughs> that. So I'm always hearing that dwarf galaxies like this are among the oldest uh, uh, galaxies in the, uh, in the universe. And so okay. that doesn't necessarily mean the stars are old, but it, what, what, is, what is meant by that when we say they're among the okay. oldest galaxies? I think that's actually a misconception that people will promulgate. Um, the point being that when we look to the early universe, we see objects that look, resemble, that have as much starbursting activity as these dwarf irregular galaxies do. Uh, um, so they're just projecting what they, what they're yeah. seeing in the distant universe. Um, now, the, 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 the idea in hierarchical galaxy formation is that small things form first, right? And then those small things gather together to form bigger things. So you don't form a giant elliptical right away. You actually form small things, and then they smash together and, and, and merge together, and then they end up forming a giant elliptical. Okay. But there is another problem with that is that the small things that form early are the ones that are going to get built into these giant ellipticals. Uh, for a dwarf galaxy to that uh, that exists today, if it was formed at the beginning of the universe, it probably got incorporated into a larger structure by uh, by now. So the, uh, the the dwarf galaxies that we see that are still on their own today probably didn't form really early in the universe. They probably formed middling in the universe, so oh, that okay. they still survive to, through today. Because you know gravity is a one-way street. Once you merge together, you're stuck together. You're not gonna, <laughs> you're not going to separate. Yep. Despite okay. what the accelerating universe says, okay? <laughs> <laughs> Until that happens. <laughs> <laughs> okay, cool. Thanks for the clarification. That really helps. All right. So our next story, um, and this is one that we're going to be coming back to a bunch of times. Uh, this is a preview of a Martian visitor. Now, that is not a Martian who's going to visit Earth, but instead an object that is going to visit Mars. Now, we remember last year, Tony, when we talked about Comet Ison. Oh, yeah. And uh, we talked about Comet Ison a lot. Mm -hmm. Well, this is Hubble's picture of Comet Ison from about a year ago, April 10th, 2013. Yep. And Hubble, because it has the finest resolution of any optical telescope, is useful in characterizing these comets on their way in. That it can see what no other telescope can see, right? And so we studied Comet Ison because Comet Ison was going to take a really close pass by the sun. All right, and uh, so this is a plot of Ison's orbit, and you can see that it comes diving in, kind of came really close to the sun, and then exited. Uh, unfortunately, Comet Ison was didn't live up to its its its, its total hype uh, because it had that wonderful breakup uh, last November. And so here is the plot from the Soho camera of uh, the time lapse of Comet Ison as it comes in at the bottom, passes by the sun, and slowly disintegrates as it exits off the top of the screen and becomes just a great big cloud of ice and dust uh, orbiting around the sun instead of a, a, a comet itself. 
Yeah, but I still thought that was cool. I don't know about you, but that, I mean, we didn't exactly see it that way, <laughs> <laughs> but it was uh, it was still pretty neat that that happened. Yeah, I really enjoyed it too. I was uh, you know following this as much as I could uh, because remember I was on a cruise ship at the time, and you know downloading yeah, the information yeah, was, was difficult. Rough. Yeah, that was that was that was that was, that was a hard time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but so we had a, a close encounter with the sun last year. Uh, but this year, we're going to have a different close encounter um, by this comet. And this comet is Comet Siding Spring. Uh, this is Hubble's picture from March 11th, 2014. And Siding Spring was discovered by a guy who's discovered a lot of comets, Robert McNaught. Uh, I don't know if you remember Comet McNaught from 2007. Am yep. Amazing, gorgeous comet. Uh, unfortunately, only visible in the southern hemisphere. Uh, we didn't get to see it up here, and there's been a couple other comic McNaughts, but he discovered this comet, and instead of calling it another comic McNaught, uh, he, they called it Comet Siding Spring after the observatory uh, where he discovered the Siding Spring Observatory in Australia. So this is the view of Comet Siding Spring that Hubble has, and the reason we're looking at it is because Comet Siding Spring, come next October, is going to have a really close pass near Mars. So on October 19th of this year, Comet Siding Spring is going to make a close pass towards Mars. And you're going to, have, of course, ask, well, how close is that? Well, on this diagram... How close is that? Thank you, Tony. I'm so glad you asked. <laughs> on the left side of this diagram, I've got the path of Comet Siding Spring drawn in as a line. It's going to come by at such a sharp angle, it's, it's effectively a line. And on the right side, that orange spot is uh, to scale the, the size of Mars. Mars is about, what, uh, 6,800 kilometers across mm -hmm. yep. in diameter. So the distance is going to be 135,000 kilometers or 86,000 miles for those who uh, work in, in, in English units. And that seems awfully large or small, all right? But let's put it into some perspective. Uh, the distance is actually going to be only 20 Mars diameters away. That's kind of cool, all right? Uh, you know, it's going to pass within 20 Mars diameters. Uh, if you note uh, at Earth, one of the things I have memorized about Earth and, and, and our moon is that our moon is about 30 Earth diameters away. Yeah. So relatively, it's even closer than our moon. And actually, the distance of 135,000 kilometers is half the distance from Earth to the moon. So that it's passing, you know, half the distance from Earth to the moon. All right, but so this would be like having a comet pass right directly, yeah, like you know, right in the middle there. So that would be scary to watch from right. Earth. But from Mars, and, I'm happy with this. <laughs> from Mars, but from Mars, Mars's moons are actually much closer. Um, Phobos and Deimos are these tiny little asteroid captured asteroid type things. They aren't really respectable moons, in my opinion. Uh, but you can see that they orbit relatively close to their planet. All right, so Phobos and Deimos are still well inside. Uh, the passage of Comet Siding Spring. The really cool thing about this is that the coma of the comet is already about 20,000 kilometers across. Whoa. All right. The, the comet itself <laughs> is only going to be a few kilometers, maybe at most like 10 or 20 kilometers. They, they still don't have a good estimate for the measurement of the size of the comet, but its coma is at least 20 kilometers across already. Yeah. Um, 20,000 kilometers across. Right, and it could grow to be about a hundred thousand or kilometers across or more. That's right, as it gets closer to the sun. So right, and so right now it's out by Jupiter. When it gets in towards Mars, if that coma is large enough, it, that coma will actually pass across Phobos, Deimos, and Mars, and then we have the really cool prospect of seeing meteor showers on Mars. All right. Man. Because all of that stuff that's in the coma yeah. smashes into Mars' atmosphere, and we got the rovers on the surface to sit and watch meteor showers on Mars. How cool would that be? So, can you imagine what that's going to look like? I mean, that'll be amazing. Up in, the, I mean, the Martian sky is going to be a, just full of activity during this time. So, will the? Do you know if the rovers are going to be in a position to be able to see something? I mean, they're not going to be on the other side of the planet or anything, are they? Um, they are definitely going to try. Okay, okay. the uh, the scientists who who now know about this uh, and and the engineers are are feverishly work, working on this to make sure that you know curiosity and spirit and opportunity are available to um, take uh, to to have good looks in case there are meteor showers. Okay. So, 
that's going to be cool. But you know, meteors generally tend, uh, happen due to very small pieces of the comet that uh, pass through the atmosphere. But not everything is going to be these really small dust grain sized, micron sized objects. There might be some larger ones. You know, bolides occur, you know, because there's a crab apple sized type rock um, uh, coming through the atmosphere. And you have to remember that we also at Mars have uh, experiments orbiting around in Mars. Orbit. That's right, good. I'm glad you brought that up. Right. So this is Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter here in this picture, but we've also got Mars Express and we've got Mars Odyssey. Um, and the brand new experiment, MAVEN, will be arriving at Mars in September of this year, one month before Comet Sighting <laughs> Spring passes by. You have to batten down the hatches right away. <laughs> so we got another reason that we really want to monitor this so that we know how big is it going to be, how much danger could it pose, possibly pose, to our, uh, to our missions in orbit around Mars. Now, right now, the, the folks there say, yeah, no, 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 it's, it's, it's nothing to worry about yet. But we're going to monitor it to see what, see what happens. So we got so, another cool comet passage uh, come October of this year. So how do you, how, why aren't they more nervous about, I mean, how can they be so sure that things are going to be okay? I don't think they're sure that things are going to be okay, but there's no reason to get uh, nervous and, and, and crazy about something until they have more information. Well, there's also a lot, not like there's a whole lot they can do about it either, I guess. But I was just curious because, I mean, if a comet comes that close to a planet and you've got things in orbit, uh, all kinds of things could happen. So, Right. So curious. the you know the only things you could do is try and make sure the, um, the satellite is on the opposite side of the planet uh, when it passes by or something, or if there's a way of you know, turn, closing up any, any instruments that are, might be vulnerable. Put the lens caps on, yeah. Yes, exactly. Stuff like that. If we were, <laughs> if we were Hubble, we might you know, close, the, close the lid or something like that. Put it into safe mode. Whatever you need to do to make sure that it survives nicely and then bring it back up. Yeah. But right now, they, they would not predict that that is necessary. Okay. So, uh, for Comet Ison, what did Hubble do last year? Uh, and on the left is the image of Comet Ison, and on the right is a specially processed image where we have subtracted a coma, okay, a model for the coma. So, as we said, the, the comet is really, really small, and all of this gas and dust is being, uh, is coming off that, uh, of that comet. And if it came off in a nice spherically symmetric smooth distribution, uh, you can subtract off that idea of a smooth distribution to try and see if there are any jets of material. And with Comet Ison, you can see we saw what looked like, you know, possibly uh, some jets coming off of it last year. Uh, with Comet Siding Springs, we did the exact same thing. And uh, we take that March 11th image, subtract off a smooth coma model, and you get, again, what looks like jets coming off. Now, what we've done actually is we've taken several images of Comet Siding Spring, and we've got three epochs of it. And so here in this, you can see October, January, and March, and you can see the relative changes in yeah. what looks like these jets. Now, in the analysis of this, they say that they have definitive proof that there are at least two jets coming off of Comet Siding Spring. And the orientation is a little bit difficult to interpret, simply because, remember, Earth is orbiting between October, January, and March, Earth actually moves a, a good amount through the solar system, so the angles aren't the same on all of these. But they can use these jets to measure the rotation rate of the comet and what its orientation is, and uh, have a good prediction for which directions uh, a material will be uh, spewed out uh, greatest in. Okay. So you, I mean, if I if I look at these in my own little animation in my brain, I can kind of see the rotation anyway. I mean, I, it's it's some, maybe it's an optical illusion, but yeah, I can see that it changes orientation with each with each frame. But like you say, they don't know that it's difficult to to pinpoint exactly. I guess. Right. Well, you have to take into account the Earth's motion through the solar system, yeah. uh, and so the different angles that we're viewing it at. And so, unless you do that mathematical analysis, you're not going to be able to, to to get the true rotation. And the the um, results I saw did not clarify that as to whether they were seeing uh, what we're seeing here is true rotation or whether it's just apparent rotation from our from our motion. Sure. So. 
we now have some cool ideas, uh, some 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 initial measurements on Comet Sighting Spring. Uh, we know that there are jets to monitor, and so we will be monitoring it through uh, throughout the summer, uh, on as it comes in and makes its approach toward toward Mars in October. So that'll be a cool event to look forward to. Uh, can you say something about what we can expect to see from here? Uh, oh, that's actually uh, the, the, the <laughs> one thing I, I forgot to mention last night. Uh, so, unfortunately, um, Comet Sighting Springs is coming in from the Oort cloud. It's got about a million year long orbit at the best estimate right now. Uh, it's not going to get close enough to Earth, and it's not going to get close enough to the Sun to make an sky. So, it will be visible for Mars, uh, but it won't be. Okay. So you're making up a little bit on that we got from that was that the uh, the this is be more obviously so not necessarily more. Is this the main question? Yeah, you're frozen and the uh is copy, fortunately. Okay, so now, okay, so he's, we were doing so well. Oh, now I'm seeing me. Okay, well, I'll go back to me. Uh, okay, so just when we thought we had it. <laughs> I'm hearing something now. Are you there, Frank? Okay, so he's dropped out again. Uh, all right. Okay. Well, hopefully he'll be able to come join us again soon. Um, so let's see what, while, while we're waiting here. Uh, see what we've got here on our comments stuff. Uh, if we've got anything going on. Uh, I'm seeing some of the comments. Here's one uh, from Go. Okay. From Katie Coco on uh, YouTube uh, is asking, uh, asked the question, uh, I just want to know what you hope to do with this image of SP in the first image. I don't think it will be that in perverse as USD takes. Uh, uh, whatever they it might be something like a little with the uh, with the ear cam, uh, the, um, uh, the, cam the infrared camera on board, and you don't know how they're going to uh, choose which, uh, which object to look at first. But it'll be almost certainly to evaluate the cameras on board. Are you back, Frank, or are you still working on that? Uh... I can't. Uh, you're coming through as being totally choppy in the text. Hmm. Okay. Uh, now you're back. That's weird. Okay. Yeah, somebody says, sound is robotic or is it just me? Yeah. Uh, it was like from 4.30 to 4.33 uh, Eastern Time, we got a uh, network problem that's affecting, you know, uh, this isn't affecting my laptop, which is on visitor land. It's actually affecting my, um, my base workstation here. Oh, okay. And that's on the base network. And... Uh... Yeah. I, okay. Well, you seem to be back now, so I think we're we're good. Okay. Uh, Did I? Am I screen sharing? Okay. Yeah. Uh, right now, your screen share is not up. I don't see it. Right, let me let me get back and screen share. Okay. There we go. That should come back up in a sec. Okay. Yep, I see it. Okay. Wonderful. Okay, go ahead. All right. So I think we got to the end of the Siding Spring story, or was uh, I can't remember <laughs> if we got there. Yeah, but the point well, is, is, we were. I, I was asking you about what what it would look like from Earth and what you know what we would see, and, and your answer was that while Mars will have a good view, uh, it won't get close enough to the Sun uh, to make a very good show for Earth. Uh, that would be it. Yeah. Okay. So okay. we get to our final story, which is actually a very short story because it's a to-be-continued-next-month story. Ah. 
So uh, I call this story an early anniversary present. Uh, so if we remember back uh, 24 years ago, on April 24th, 1990, um, that is the space shuttle launching from Cape Canaveral, uh, carrying the Hubble Space Telescope in the payload bay. Uh, the oh, largest... Good old good days. <laughs> very good day. Uh, the largest object that could even fit inside the payload bay, because that was sort of one of the constraints of Hubble, that it had to fit in the, in the shuttle payload bay, uh, being carried aloft. Uh, and it's also funky to notice that they were doing a uh, some testing on, they actually had another space shuttle on the other launch pad at the same time. Uh, they were doing some testing on, on, on the other shuttle. So we had two shuttles on the launch pad uh, back in 1990. And then the next day, April 25th, 1990, this glorious, isn't it? Yeah, that's an awesome picture. And that was taken for the IMAX film uh, that, that, that followed it. So this is, I think this is from the IMAX camera sitting in the payload bay as it was deployed. And so on April 25th, Hubble was uh, deployed into space. One of the few times you're ever going to see that, that front gate close, too. I, I recently learned they don't close that unless they absolutely have to. Right, yeah, that, that, you know, that's never closed. Um, I can't tell you if it's ever been closed since 1990. Yeah. <laughs> I think uh, the thinking is it'd be like, you know, if we close it just to work it out and then it doesn't open again. <laughs> you know, I suppose so we got to close it when we chance. do the, the servicing missions on it, right? Yeah, yeah, but now there's not going to be any more. So if they, they close right. it now and it doesn't <laughs> open, and it's like, oh, oops. Yeah, why take that risk? <laughs> yeah, really. <laughs> All right. Um, so every year for Hubble's anniversary, uh, we have to do some something special, right? And the Hubble Heritage team for the last several years has decided to come up with a really cool observation. So, you know, we've done the, the Horsehead Nebula, we've done uh, the Whirlpool Galaxy. Uh, one year we did uh, the, those 59 different images of galaxy collisions for our 18th, 18th anniversary. Uh, we did Mystic Mountain for the 20th anniversary. So it's become tradition to have a really cool image to release to celebrate Hubble's uh, anniversary. Now, of course, that doesn't occur until later this month. All right. Um, but uh, this Last month, uh, in March, they had a conference in Rome, uh, Science with the Hubble Space Telescope, uh, I guess the fourth version of this conference. And so the powers that be here at Space Telescope decided that, hey, you know what, it would be really nice if we could release the image uh, in association with this conference. And then, you know, the folks at the conference could, you know, see, see the, 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 uh, the anniversary image early. So we did that. Okay, but we still save something for the actual anniversary. So here, what we did is we looked at a star-forming region, and we looked at a small piece of a star-forming region. When you form stars, those bright stars actually eat away the gas of the nebula, and they form these famous pillars that we've seen in many other images, right? And so we looked at a pillar in what's called the Monkey's Head Nebula. And we didn't look at it using visible light because visible light, you know, um, you see a dark pillar. We actually, this time we looked at it in infrared light. And so Hubble's 24th anniversary image is a pillar in the Monkey Head Nebula. And now that I've built it up for minutes and minutes here, I'll actually show it to you. <laughs> and there it is. Ah, uh, ooh. You know, I never did see the monkey head in this, but anyway. <laughs> You're not going to see the monkey head in this image, right? Because this is just one pillar within the whole monkey head nebula. The monkey head nebula is much, much bigger. But I wasn't going to show you the monkey head nebula until next month when I actually show you our 3D visualization of flying into the monkey head nebula. Oh, nice. All That'll right. I half expected you to show me a picture of that angry monkey from Family Guy in the closet. You know? <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, uh, maybe we'll work on that. <laughs> Use that as an Easter egg for our visualization better, next month. Um, so, okay, great. This is so. This is this is this is something we do every year uh, to mark the anniversary of the Hubble Space Telescope, and this is this year's anniversary image. So this is amazing. 
This is a really cool image, and it's in infrared. So not only do you see all sorts of stars in the image um, that you wouldn't see using visible light, but you'll notice that you'll see lots of galaxies in this image. You're looking through the nebula on through the stars of our galaxy behind the nebula, and you're seeing distant galaxies behind that. Uh, and there's all sorts of cool details in this image that I didn't want to go into today because I'll be able to show them off uh, really cool next month uh, when I not only show you the image and the whole monkey head nebula, but also a 3D visualization of a fly into the, uh, the monkey head nebula, the pillar in the monkey head nebula. So in the optical, this is just one big dust cloud um, that isn't very remarkable, but in the infrared, you can see all kinds of glowing dust and gas that's inside this star-forming region. I would say it's a, it's, it's a nice pink uh, uh, emission nebula in optical, uh, but you get a lot more detail and structure with the infrared because the infrared light has longer wavelength, so it penetrates deeper into the dust clouds, and also these dust clouds are at temperatures that where they glow in the infrared. Right. They aren't they aren't hot enough to glow that much. Only only portions of them are hot enough to glow uh, in visible light, but mo more of them are hot enough to glow uh, in infrared light. What is the characteristic for these pillars? We see them a lot in a lot of Hubble images. Um, what causes a pillar usually? Uh, the pillars come from the high energy radiation of newborn stars that eats away the low density gas. So the ultraviolet light and the strong stellar winds from massive newborn stars uh, eat away the low density gas, leave only the highest density regions. And the shadow region behind those high density regions form uh, a pillar. So that, and then in, 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 in lots of the same areas where stars are being born and stellar winds are uh, creating these variations in density. Exactly. Okay. Get a, a lot of pillars star forming regions. Okay, cool. Thank you. Well, uh, is, is that it? Is, did you have more to show us, or, or was that the last slide you have? That's all I got for this month. Okay, well, thank you, Frank. This has been really cool. So, um, I like that we do this every month because Frank is able to get us caught up on the. He, he has a perspective that, that nobody else needs to do does because he keeps an eye on a lot of different areas, of, uh, not just Hubble science, but things that, that would be interesting uh, of educators and, and lots of the audiences. And I remember when we were doing ice on stuff planning last year, we were, uh, he was already talking about this comet, so uh, the one that's passing by Mars. So that is, uh, that is really, I really appreciate you taking the time out, Frank, to uh, get us caught up on stuff. Um, I am looking to see if we've got any uh, questions, and I'm not seeing any. I had one uh, earlier that I'll ask you about, Frank. Uh, you can maybe uh, have something uh, to say about it. Uh, Katie Stoko from YouTube but it wanted to know um, if uh, what what we hope we'll be able to see with JWST when it takes its first image. And I was just curious what your thoughts are on that. It's going to be, uh, the first images off of JWST are probably going to be relatively unremarkable, but that may be wrong. Okay, well, the very first images from JWST will be like they were from Hubble. They'll just be calibration images. Right. Right. We'll be, you know, calibrating the telescope and such. But the first publicly released images will be ones that will be specially chosen uh, to have some uh, scientific as well as aesthetic value. Maybe I'm reading the question a little too literally, so let's, in case I am, let's go ahead and expand that a little bit to think, what do we hope will be some of the first things JWST looks at, scientifically? Okay. First things I would look at um, are dust disks around other stars, because JWST will have the resolution and the infrared wavelengths to be able to look deeply into those dust disks and try and see planets forming around them. Uh, there are a number of dust disks in the Orion Nebula that I think would be absolutely beautiful uh, first targets to go take a look at and see what's going on there. So when you say dust disks, you mean these protoplanetary disks? These, these protoplanetary disks. These planets these pre-solar systems that are just forming? They're solar systems in formation, but because the dust is dense and, and dark, 
uh, when we look at it with visible light, we need infrared light to look deeper into them and see the warm gas clouds forming planets within them. So that's one of my first uh, observations that I would do with it. Okay. Um, so the uh, this one, let me, let me select this question here. Uh, this is from Michael Jobin again. Hi, Michael. It's good to see you. It's nice. I'm glad you uh, um, take some time out to uh, always comment on our stuff. Um, hey, I just bought a C-band satellite Earth dish just to get good <laughs> live and complete coverage on NASA Select TV of the HST launch, just to record it all on VHS. <laughs> Yeah, so you had this high quality uh, thing, and then you got it all on VHS. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that is uh, one of the things. Actually, you know, uh, with uh, Neil Tyson doing the Cosmo series, um, I looked up in my closet, and I have a pristine version of the original Cosmos by Carl Sagan ah. on VHS. <laughs> yes, <laughs> so do I. <laughs> Uh, let me ask your opinion on that, Frank. I get a lot of questions about this. Let me get your take. Sure. What do you think of Cosmos? Do you watch it every week? Uh, I don't watch it every week because I do astronomy for a living, and when I get home, it's not that relaxing to go listen you know to somebody what? else talk I, about astronomy. I hear you. I hear you, brother. <laughs> I feel the same way. I actually don't watch it right away. I kind of right. let it queue up on my DVR a little bit. I have uh, episodes queued up on my DVR, and I have watched some of it. And you know that my specialty is uh, ast uh, scientific visualizations. And one, and so I, I don't have any problem with Neil. I don't have any problem with the writing. I don't have any problem with the story. They, they're, you know, they go too far this way or too far that way, and everybody's going to do it when they present the universe. I'm going to pick on what I know best, and it's the depictions of astronomy in the in the visualizations and there I gotta say too much power was given to these Hollywood computer graphics companies because they didn't they made basic scientific errors in some of the graphics and that's what really has bothered me about it you know, and again I'm just saying that's because that's my specialty but when they have that spaceship of the mind dodging asteroids in an asteroid belt I gotta say what the hell because Neil knows much better that the asteroid belt is relatively empty. And it, yeah. you know the depiction from The Empire Strikes Back is just yeah, yeah. wrong. That's right, okay. yeah. It's and possibly close together. So whoever was supposed to do scientific oversight of their graphics, the, the, the beautiful, beautiful stuff that they're coming up with, um, there are several really bad errors uh, in the graphics. You know, they depict the great red spot on Jupiter as being a depression, like uh, the eye of a tornado, right? Well, that's exactly opposite uh, of the truth. The truth is, is that the red clouds in the great red spot are actually eight miles higher than the surrounding clouds. So they gave it to some Hollywood guys who said, oh, this looks like this, and then they, they, they put it together and, and put it on TV in front of 8 million people, but 8 million people got to see the wrong thing. And that's what I don't like. That's, that's, that would be my, my, my pick uh, on, on the show. Yeah, I hear you, and I, and I, I agree that that's probably a, a, a pretty important part you want to make darn sure you get right because – you know, that's the part that people are, you know, they're, they're trying to connect these ideas and, and the text, and they need something visual, and that's what's going to make the connection. So I, I see your point, I, and I agree with you on that. Um, I guess from my perspective, though, you know, I loved Cosmos a lot. I really did, and it was the first show of its kind uh, that had ever been done. Uh, we learned about astronomy. I couldn't believe I was getting astronomy information in my <laughs> living room in the 70s and 80s, and it was just... Yeah. I, I was hooked, and I for something about Carl Sagan. There was this these ways in which he did things. There was this one where he's sitting on a boat talking about whales, going, "Whoop, oh, you know," and just doing these <laughs> weird just isms that he that only he could do, and I that was endearing, but it's also not duplicatable in my opinion. Right. I think that Neil could have done a show that was his. And not Cosmos, and I, there's just some things I don't think we need to do again. Um, right. I don't care how time passes. You know? I think that you know they they did a show called Cosmos because that's what's going to get funded, right? 
Uh, I know, and right. that's what's going to get the attention. Yeah. But you know, the major difference I find in the storytelling here is that these aren't Neil's stories that he's telling. Uh, they have script writers, uh, Andrew and Steve Soder, who wrote the script, and Neil is the ne uh, Neil is the host who's mm -hmm. using their script. Yeah. Now, I worked with Neil for for five years. I actually knew him for several years before that. Um, we met when when I was uh, doing a postdoc in Princeton. And he had, his office was right right next to mine in the Princeton Department of Astrophysics. And when he gets on a roll and he's telling one of his stories, I mean, he's fantastic, absolutely amazing, right? And I can just feel that, you know, he's telling not quite his stories. There are times when he really, you know, his passion does show through. And I think the sincerity that Carl did came because it, were really, it was really more, it was his, he chose the stories, he chose the way he was going to tell them. A little, he had a little bit more control. Over. That's well said. I couldn't. That I agree one thousand percent. And you hit on, I think, the real key there is that. I, and I know what you mean. I've seen it with, in interviews with Neil when I I was watching him. He's all over, but you see him. I saw. I was watching him one day on on uh, talking with Bill Moyers on Sunday morning, and and he was giving an interview about you know just they were just asking him all kinds of random questions, and his answers were very passionate. And you and you're right. I saw what you're talking about. Every once in a while, he would get on a roll. You do it too when you're out in front of people. <laughs> Uh, you get on a roll. You start to get into a groove that you have your own style that when you're telling your story your way, there is simply no other way. Uh, that there's, you know, you're, you're making your own unique and indelible mark on the story, and that's more memorable than trying to duplicate something else. I think that's your I, – I, I love that. I love the way you put it because you're right. That is it. Neil is not doing Neil. Neil is doing Carl, or at least – a version of him, and I think that's where it kind of, I don't want to say falls flat, but it, it isn't as inspiring as it could. Yeah, it, it, it's, it's not that it's not inspiring, okay? It's, right. it's good stuff, and it's really good stuff. It's just, uh, you know, we, we, we always pick on the edges to see what could be just slightly better or what could what might make it, you know, reach the level. Uh, that Carl got. But, I mean, you know, I don't want to. But it may be inspiring to people who've never who've never seen anything like it before, and that and that's good. That is good. Um, so Michael Jobin is asking how my ping is, and I think that's in relation to uh, the problems we were having earlier. I just did a test while we, while we were having the problems, and my my ping is 19 milliseconds, and I have plenty of bandwidth, right. so it's just not me. Uh, we got so I'm not quite. And the fact that both of us were having the problems says that it's not either of our connections. Right. Yeah. Both of our connections were were having problems at the same time, and it it came on it came on again just a little bit uh, uh, later on. Yeah. I don't know if you heard that. So you know. yeah. And I think it's just part of being at the mercy of this of this technology. I mean, I just think that there are periods of congestion or whatever, not necessarily at our end, because I have had my internet connection diagnosed with a fine tooth, tooth comb. So anyway, thank you guys for your patience. It seems to have gone away though. Okay, uh, any other, uh, I'm looking here to see if there's any others real quick before we go. Um, Carlos Fartburger, really? <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, I, gotta, I just got to show this. I mean, it's just like crazy. Carlos Fartburger. Uh, so he goes, <laughs> he's from YouTube. Great stuff, guys. I'm going to watch this. Uh, I guess look uploaded later. Uh, and thank you for watching, at least as long as you could. I just had to show Carlos Farberger. That's all I just wanted to <laughs> um, Okay. I guess that's it for this week, guys. Uh, Frank, do you have anything else you'd like to add? Any announcements? Anything you want people to look at? Um, just that we have uh, two public lectures this month, uh, April 29th. We have an amazing uh, guest speaker from uh, the Library of Congress and De Denver Museum of Nature and Science. Um, um, for, I'm blanking on his last name. Do you remember David, Tony? David Grinspoon. Yep. David Grinspoon. I, yep. I was, I was going to come up with some Harry Potterish something spoon <laughs> type name, you know. <laughs> David Grinspoon it will be speaking on uh, the human era on Earth. He calls it uh, Terra Sapiens. And then May 6th, we have uh, Bonnie Meinke, a um, Saturn expert, who will be talking on the making of moons. And Saturn has really has the coolest moons in the solar system. Uh, well, some of the Jupiter moons are, are cool too, but Saturn just has so such variation across their moons that she should have a really good talk then.
Yeah, All right. I mean, uh, yeah, I wouldn't. I wouldn't uh, put Europa any any uh, any slouching slouchy moon. Um, so uh, uh, I'm hoping that um, I, I don't. I don't want to promise it yet because I haven't talked to anybody at the institute. But I'm hoping to get permission to live stream those uh, public lecture series on YouTube as well, so you guys can leave comments and uh, you'll be notified uh, via the subscribe. If you subscribe to our YouTube channel, and you had better be. Uh, subscribe to it. Um, you'll get notified, and uh, you'll you'll be reminded when those those public talks are coming. Also, Frank, I spoke to you about this briefly, but I just want to make sure I'm. I kind of want to have a hangout with you and David when they when he gets here. Can we maybe do that? Uh, it depends on David's schedule. I've talked to uh, John Devis about it, but uh, haven't gotten any response. So yeah, we're gonna try and uh, do okay. that. And you and I should do a, a hangout on our our new video page. Uh, in a couple weeks. Yes, yes, we'll be talking about that. I don't want to give. You told me not to talk about it, so I'm not gonna. <laughs> <laughs> Just let people know that we got lots of cool things upcoming. Yeah, okay. Well, yeah, we've got we we do, and so that's what's uh, on on tap. Look for another public lecture series late in April and early May. I'll get what hangout if I can get David Grinspoon and and Frank and a hangout together. I would love that because. David is my old professor from the University of Colorado, and I have a lot of questions about, with him. He's a great expert on Venus as well, so we can get a lot of good uh, uh, stuff from him. And I will let you know. Follow us on, subscribe to our YouTube channel. Follow us on Twitter at Hubble Telescope. Uh, I'm at Deep Astronomy. Frank is at Dr. Frank Summers. And hopefully, we will see you guys next time. Thank you for watching, and as always, keep looking up. Give us a little uh, summary of some of the stories he's got his eye on, oh. and uh, I'm going to go ahead and let you get started, Frank. Go ahead. <laughs> In the meantime, I'm going to post that link. Go ahead. All right. right here. So, um, all right. So, I'm going to talk to you about the news from the universe for April 2014. And every night, every month at the public lecture series, I give our uh, an update on the uh, public uh, on on recent Hubble discoveries, and sometimes I include other. Uh, discoveries, but uh, this month I only have some Hubble things. And so my first story is, call, I called it a clockwork galaxy. Now I did this because, uh, well, you'll see why I did this, but um, what are the cool things we've been able to do with Hubble that really it wasn't particularly intended to do was to do really high precision astrometry. Now we've got these uh, instruments on Hubble called the fine guidance sensors, and uh, the Fine guidance sensors in association with some really cool computer techniques have allowed us to measure really, really, really high precision of uh, the positions of stars. And so the first example I remember from a few years ago was in this image. In the, uh, it's a core of the globular cluster Omega Centauri. Now, Omega Centauri contains about... Uh, because we don't want to just hear our own voices. We want to hear you guys, at least in the form of comments and and questions. <laughs> so uh, please, uh, please let us know what you think. Frank, welcome. Tony, how you yeah. doing today? I'm good. It's April. It's getting warm out, or at least got trying it. to. Uh, I am so ready for this winter to be over. I'll tell you, it is like <laughs> the worst season. So, no, uh, um, as I said last month a bunch of times, I can tell you when the vernal equinox is going to happen, but I can't tell you when spring is going to come. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. That's or at least when it's going to feel like it. I mean, uh, I grew, I, I lived in Boulder, Colorado for like 30 years, and the the you know it got cold there in January, sure, but the snows didn't really hit until March and April. That's when we really got inundated, and right now they're getting inundated again. So those spring snows are usually measured in feet. I mean, that's how much snow they get this time of year. Um, so I'm glad I don't have to deal with that. But uh, anyway, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's good to be on the upswing, at least on the, on the warming trend. So Most definitely. How did it go last night? So last night you did the uh, public lecture series. Yeah, we had a great public lecture series. We do it the first two, about a million, maybe 10 million stars. So this is a really, really small patch of it. But what they were able to do is by taking images of this field several years apart and by using computer processing to really measure the centroids of these star dots, they were able to measure the motions of these stars only over a few years and then extrapolate them to what they would be over 10,000 years. So based upon several images like this,
they were able to take those stars in that white box and they were able to figure out that these are their motions, these are their speeds, which are where they will move over the course of the next 10,000 years. Is there a way to tell which one is the extrapolated data points, or does it matter here in this? Well, in this one, you're seeing uh, lines, which basically are, point, are, are, are dots point plotted for each of the stars at a, at a specific interval. So the longer ones with longer tails are ones that are moving faster uh, across the image, and the ones with the shorter tails are ones that are moving slower. Ah, OK. All right, so what they did is they took the, the star from where it was and they trailed it uh, to show where it, will, uh, where it will be moving to. And do you have an idea how many, how many images was it based on to get the initial? Day of every month, and um, uh, Armin Rest was uh, really uh, had a, great, had a great, great talk about light echoes. And uh, the point is, is that, you know, one of the points I made at the end of the talk was that the speed of light seems infinite in our everyday life, but when in astronomy, we can actually see the propagation of light across uh, light years of space, and we can actually see things happening in the past. And so the, um, the use of light echoes to actually observe things that happened 100 years ago, uh, 1,000 years ago, is actually a really cool prospect, and that's what he's exploring. So I suggest everyone uh, find that webcast on our site uh, and uh, take a look at it. Yeah, I'm getting the uh, I'm getting the link together right now, uh, and I'll and I'll post it on the event page. But what Frank is talking about, he, one of the one of the issues that, that Armin brought up was he was studying these light echoes, where you could actually see from subtracted images from one year to another of a supernova, you could see these expanding light waves or light echoes, he called them. And what Frank's talking about is that yes, you know, this is an example of the distances in astronomy are so vast that you can actually see the speed of light in uh, in, in in operation there. So. Uh, it really was a great talk, and I'll post a link here in just a second. So Frank's going to give. Hello, everybody, and welcome to our latest Hubble Hangout. And this month, Mar it's, it's, if it fits the first Wednesday of the month, it must be time for our Hubble Hangout with uh, Dr. Frank Summers, the outreach astronomer, astrophysicist at the Space Telescope Science Institute, who meets with us most <laughs> months at this time. We didn't do it last week because we were. Uh, occupied last week with uh, South by Southwest and couldn't get to it, but uh, we're back this month. Uh, we had our public lecture series last night. It was a really interesting talk by Dr. Armin Rest, and it is on our website, which I will provide a link to uh, here in, as the as the uh, hangout progresses. But um, don't forget, we we're we're here for not only to to present you with the latest news and and information from Hubble Space Telescope. We also want to get your comments and questions, so please leave a comment on the uh, Google Plus event page. I've just tweeted about it. You can also use the uh, and also uh, Frank's uh, Doctor Fr at Doctor Frank Summers. He's also tweeted about it. Just follow that link and start commenting. You can also tweet using the hashtag Hubble Hangout, and I'll see that. And finally, uh, there's also the YouTube page where this is also being broadcast on our channel. I'm monitoring those comments as well, as well as the Q and A app all kinds of ways to talk to us, so we hope you'll do it. Uh